Hey everybody, my name is Ted Forbes and welcome back again to The Art of Photography. Today our subject is metering, using a light meter. And I want to talk about this today in the context of night photography and shooting at night. Um, I had a recent experience where I went out and did some night shooting with a friend of mine and I realized that this is really a good subject we need to talk about on here because there was a lot of adjustments that I found myself having to make. and. I guess I'm going to refer back to some other podcasts and some earlier episodes that we did on metering, and you can see those in the show notes. I'll put links however you're watching this. Um, you might want to consult the show notes. I'm not going to repeat a lot of that information today because I think when we've covered metering in the past, we've talked about it from a very technical perspective. We've talked about using a light meter, using things like Sunny 16, um, you know, to basically meter your composition and, and get the best exposure that you can possibly do. Um, what I want to talk about today is more the creative side of that and adjustments that you'll need to make. And, you know, really it comes down to this. The best tool for this is going to be your own mind and your eye. And I know that seems kind of maybe a little plebeian and obvious way of looking at it because we have covered those technical aspects of it before. But really what's going to happen is, is if you're using a modern DSLR, especially where you're using a, a very current camera that has a very advanced metering system in it for measuring light, um, a lot of times it, it's going to differ from camera to camera. So again, you're going to need to consult your own manual to know what mode you're using for that. Um, but today we're going to throw that aside just a little bit. Um, a lot of times the more advanced metering modes that the cameras have now uh, use a type of evaluative metering. And so what it does is it puts several places on that scene and it's going to look for the light areas and the dark areas. And then essentially what it does is it runs that through a system of algorithms that are stored inside your, your camera's computer. And it's going to make its best educated guess as to what you're going for and that's what's going to meter a scene. So if you have your camera in some kind of automatic mode, that's what it's going to do to get its basic exposure. There are several methods for that and it picks a different method depending on what you kind of metering you have set up in your camera. There's no magic silver bullet here. Um, you know, there's no night mode you can flip on or anything like that. And what you're eventually going to have to do is make up decisions on whether or not that that exposure was exactly what you're going for as a photographer. And I'll explain a little further. Um, typically, uh, what will happen is on a digital camera you can obviously shoot and review the image right afterwards. On a film camera it's a little more difficult and you know if you're a film shooter and a lot of film shooters I always say what you want to do is really get to know the, the type of film that you're using and the environment that you're shooting in. Uh, for digital you tend to have the added advantage that you can look at that on the back of the camera. Now generally it's also kind of a common practice that a lot of photographers will just you know shoot an automatic and then they'll do a lot of post-production. Um, from my experience, I don't like to do that. I'm not saying I don't do post-production at all. I definitely do. Um, but the more that you can get right in the camera, the better off you're going to be because it's going to be easier on you. It's less time in post-production. You're not going to have to push the image further than it really wants to go if you didn't get a good exposure. And so there's things like that to keep in mind. And I think that's really important is, is, is the, the most you can, I've said that on here a lot, the most you can get right um, in camera while you're shooting, the better off you're going to be in post later. Um, but anyway, aside that, that um, you know when you're shooting at night typically and I'm gonna show you a couple images that, that I took this weekend um, what you want to remember is is when you're getting an exposure on your camera there's a certain amount of latitude whether you're shooting film or digital or whatever that the camera will pick up and anything outside that latitude tends to go either bright or dark and what you're going to be looking for and this is what Ansel Adams always described it as when he was shooting was you're looking for um, the the shades of light where you're still going to retain texture and that's a usable part of the image okay so for instance if you have highlights that get too bright and they're outside that can your camera or your film's range they're going to blow out is typically what that's known and they just go to pure white or sometimes they have a color hue to them um, shadows that get too dark lose all their texture and they become blacks so it's really easy to look at your image in those terms shooting at night is very difficult because you have this added element in there where you have a extremely wide dynamic range now the human eye will pick up most of that dynamic range uh, a lot more than your camera will or even a piece of film will. And so a lot of times you're trying to interpret what it is you're seeing that's going to be either on the computer screen, onto a piece of paper, whatever that is in the end. And that is the challenge. And sometimes when you're shooting night photography you have such an extreme dynamic range like that that if you're really looking to bring up detail and texture and shadows like a night sky that has maybe some dark clouds in it or maybe dark objects that, that you have in the foreground a lot of times you have, especially if you're shooting outdoors, a lot of street lights, sodium lights, etc. Lights on buildings, these tend to be really bright in comparison to most of what you're trying to shoot. So a lot of times you've got to get accustomed to the fact that you're going to have highlights that blow out. Typically this is not a bad thing. Um, 
they tend to get a little bigger and they'll blow out, but they still define buildings and shapes and whatnot. And it, it really all depends on your composition. And you can see where I'm going with this, that all these factors are going to be things that you're looking for as a photographer. And they're not something that a camera or a computer is going to be able to analyze really and bring through. Now this is an argument, this is not an argument of technology versus the human brain, but this is how it is. And it's really important to evaluate the scene that you're doing and try to figure out what the best exposure for that scene is. Personally, I found, um, in the, I was shooting digital the other night and I was using my Canon 5D and I noticed that it really wants to make everything too bright a lot of times. So this is a, one argument for <laughs> checking your exposure and adjusting accordingly. And there's a number of ways you can do this and we'll get into that. Um, the image I'm gonna show you right now is we had, uh, the night I was shooting there were high winds and I had some really wonderful cloud motion and I wanted to try to get some clouds to, that were coming by that were blurring. And so you can see in this first shot that I'm gonna put up, uh, this was shot, and I, I kind of did this with this episode in mind, so I just shot something, this is just, you know, I, I put the, the, the camera, it was actually in time priority mode because I wanted to get the blur of the cloud moving by, but this is not a good exposure, it's too bright. And the, the, the camera's meter was trying to evaluate this I, you know, maybe it was looking as a daylight scene or something like that, and it was a longer exposure, it was leaving the shutter open, uh, but this is too bright. This is really not what things looked like when I was there. Uh, it's not what I wanted to interpret it as. And so I found in the second shot that underexposing this two stops was the way to go. And there are a number of easy ways you can do this, but this actually retains uh, the fact that the sky is a night sky and I wanted that to go dark. And the cloud is moving across and I can adjust the contrast accordingly, but I, I didn't have anything blowing out necessarily lightwise on the cloud. But anyway, the second shot is underexposed two stops from what my meter was giving me. So the point of all this is, is if you just go out and shoot, throw it into automatic mode and see what you come up with, it's not always going to be right. And as a photographer, I think it, it, you have that power to make that decision of what the exposure needs to be. And I think that's really important. I'll show you another, another image. And this also just, you know, for another reason, um, no particular reason, was also underexposed two stops. And I'll show you the difference here. And I'm going to show you two shots. This was the shot as it came off the camera. And it was pretty good enough with the detail. There are a lot of ground lights here, but I didn't want them to blow out necessarily I mean they, they they do a little bit but you know if I had left this at you know just whatever the camera had come up with I told it to underexpose two stops but if it had been a regular exposure um, this would have been particularly um, oh, some of the lights would have blown out too much for my taste and so I wanted to tone those down which is kind of the opposite of what you do on film and but I did shoot for the highlights and then I'm developing my shadow areas so in post-processing what I'll do is the second image is just a little bit and this is a a, a very um, I'll show you the image this is a very subtle difference but I did go in and and bring in some of my shadow tones um, in post-production and I did this you know you can do it with anything Photoshop Lightroom I used Apple's Aperture uh, it's a very subtle move but I still wanted things to be dark and so anyway, so this is another scene where once again, the metering was off. It wanted to go too bright. And just in general, I've noticed that particularly on my camera, the way it meters is it wants to see things too bright when I'm shooting at night. And a lot of that is I'm really throwing the camera curveball with some weird contrasts uh, because you are shooting at night. There's some extreme darks and some extreme lights. And you kind of have to pick your middle ground and shoot for that. Now you could do HDR and we've covered that uh, previously. I'll put that episode in the show notes as well. And I did a night scene in particular in HDR. Um, but I had enough light in what I was dealing with where it really didn't call for HDR. In fact, if your clouds are moving, it's going to be pretty near impossible to get an HDR shot because you have motion and you need to shoot three images to get, or at least to get that HDR shot. Um, if objects, particularly your subject, is moving out of place, it's just not going to work. So that, that's one thing to consider. Um, so really, you know, what I would do is, is, is start developing your eye on this. Go look at photography that is representative of what you want to do. So for instance, if you want to get some night shots, start looking at photographers who are getting that and, and shooting at night. And how do their exposures look? What is it they're getting? Um, are they kind of leaning towards the dark end of things? Are they leaning towards the bright end of things? Is it an HDR kind of thing? And that is a good starting point if you're not familiar with the subject enough to what you're going for in terms of metering. And you know, that takes practice and it takes time and it takes maturity as a photographer. And that's not something that you could kind of learn from me just telling you in one video or you know, something like that. So anyway, the best thing to do is do that. The second thing is get out there and shoot. There's a number of ways you can change the exposure settings on your camera. Um, if you're kind of go down or up two stops either way, simply you can use exposure bracketing to do that. Um, you, can, you can simply tell the camera, hey, under whatever you're reading, under exposure 
close at two stops and it'll do it. Um, probably the best way to do this is, you know, particularly if you're shooting something that's sitting still and you've got a tripod going, set up your tripod figure out what your meter reading is and then flip over to manual mode and then you have all the control over the aperture or the shutter speed whichever you need to adjust um, that that is possible the other thing about using a tripod and i know it's a little off the topic here but uh, it allows you to lower your iso and when i'm shooting at night particularly because it is low lighting the camera's going to want to do stuff like you know start at at least 1600 iso or 3200 if you're shooting people you're going to need that speed because you're going to try to reduce the amount of motion that you have, particularly if you're hand shooting. If you're shooting landscape stuff like what I've done here, um, use a tripod and then, you know, you can use whatever ISO setting you want. If you have a 30 second exposure, that's fine, uh, depending on what motion you have in there. You can adjust that accordingly. And that's really important to be able to do uh, is get that ISO down because what it's going to do is, is reduce the noise considerably. And most modern digital cameras can handle noise, you know, at 200, 400, 800, just fine. Uh, it's when you get above that, you start getting the noise factor creeping in. And, you know, the most important thing is getting the shot right and getting the exposure right. That, um, rather than picking at noise or pixels or ISO, I think that's the, the most important thing. But these are some added benefits of, uh, of shooting this way. Um, so anyway, uh, some night stuff. Leave comments, questions. Uh, we can talk some more about this if you guys have anything you want me to cover on it um, in particular. But uh, I really do like shooting at night. Uh, one thing I want to add is if you do shoot film and you don't have that ability to review, what you want to do is be bracketing your exposures. And it's really easy to do. Basically, you're going to get a light reading. And sometimes it's really hard to get a light meter reading at night if you don't have a through the lens kind of deal going. Uh, but if you're shooting a medium format film camera or something like that, um, you know, it, it's a longer process to get this down. But it's like the more you can go out and shoot, uh, get used to the same film speed, um, and getting understanding exposure and bracket it. When you, if you think you have a, 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 an exposure that's determined, uh, go to the next frame, overexpose it, and go to the next frame and underexpose it. And it's kind of the same principle as getting um, an image for HDR production, even though we're using film. But what you're going to do is you're going to have several exposures to shoot from. And I think it's even more important because when you're, especially if you're doing darkroom work with film, uh, it's not like going into Aperture or Lightroom where you flip a couple switches and work with it until it kind of comes together. It's a lot more tedious. And so that's another reason to get it as right as you can you know while you're shooting in camera so anyway like i said leave a comment uh, ask me questions anything like that i'd be happy to address more on this topic once again folks this has been the art of photography thank you for watching